Hi, and welcome, and thanks for joining us. Today we'll be discussing physical security integration and access control. We'll focus on concepts and components for today's webinar. My name is David Martin, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, Linsec has been a trusted security and surveillance partner since 1998 with experience in the U.S. and around the world. Linsec has a background working with types of industries, uh, many types of industries, and we help customers develop enterprise solutions for complex physical security pro projects. We've developed a powerful security platform called Perspective Video Management Software. And this is an enterprise VMS that streams and captures IP security video and incorporates video analytics, access control, RFID, and more into the software. I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment. Uh, first, I'd like to go over a few log logistics for the webinar. We will be taking questions during the webinar, and you can enter these uh, in the GoToWebinar panel, uh, bottom right. We'll collect those during the presentation and answer questions at the end of the event. We'll also present poll questions during the event, and we'll encourage your participation in answering the questions as they are presented to you. At the end of the webinar, we'll present a survey for attendees. We ask that you answer a few quick questions to help us better serve you in future webinar events. And if you're interested in a completion certificate for today's webinar, just indicate so on the survey. We'll follow up in a few days after the webinar with certificates, answers to the questions, and a copy of today's presentation. Also, we record these webinars. We post them on the website, lensec.com, and we'll provide you with the link to the webinar video archive. We sponsor these monthly and cover a variety of safety and physical security uh, information. So check back with us and find out what's coming up next in our step in security webinar series. So today's physical security expert is Keith Harris. He's the marketing manager at Linsec. He has skill working with law enforcement and government customers selling video security products. This includes training law enforcement personnel on video surveillance investigation techniques. He spent 20 years in the broadcast news industry and has several years experience working in the video security industry as well. Keith, thank you for joining us. Thanks, David, and thanks to our attendees for joining us today. We've got a lot to cover today. We're covering physical security systems, integration, uh, with a focus on access control. We have so much good material that we decided to uh, break up this webinar into two events. Um, during today's webinar, we're going to address, uh, uh, actually, uh, we're going to address uh, access control deployment, building fire codes, security integration, uh, and highlighting uh, specific components for access control. Um, next month, we're going to take a look at security management software and unifying your physical security uh, platforms. So be watching for that and to come up next month in our June webinar. So let's jump right in and uh, buckle up and get ready for a lot of information this morning. Um, when you're planning your access control deployment, uh, you have to define your purpose. Ask what you're going to control and why. Access control categories and concepts are, are quite broad, but uh, they can be broken up into uh, um, a few ways. You can divide your goals and concepts into uh, five areas. Preventive access control uh, keeps undesirable events from occurring. Uh, you can use tools such as fences, CCTV cameras, or secured areas. Detective access control identifies undesirable events that have already occurred. Uh, you need tools like motion detection, intrusion detection, physical response uh, by a guard to discover these events. Corrective access control will correct undesirable events, events that have uh, taken place. So you're looking for correction here. The example would be initiating a lockdown in the event of a dangerous person on location. Deterrent access control discourages security violations from taking place. Uh, you'll use tools like ID badges, alarm notifications, or a manned guard desk that would fall into that category. Recovery access control restores your resources and capabilities after a violent event or an accident. Uh, for example, uh, restoring the system to normal after the lockdown event is over. 
the main idea in uh, security integration for your physical security systems is to build to develop a layer of protection. Uh, this philosophy will, will help you in your approach. Integrating multiple security systems in union with one another is complex and requires careful planning. A common example would be to use access control and video surveillance systems in a facility. Tie the two systems together um, would be your goal there. Often uh, video management software uh, will be able to monitor and control the access control systems or you can use the access control software. It has the ability to monitor the IP camera systems. This is possible because the software developers have worked together and integrated the software features for the complementary systems. It's helpful because most uh, users will only need to learn one piece of the software rather than two. The typical user is only accessing basic functions, so more advanced features of each software may not be integrated. An example for that would be uh, the administrative function for reporting. The access control system may not incorporate uh, reports for the video management software and vice versa. In another example, access control software may be able to show live views of the cameras managed by the video management software, yet they may not provide visibility on video tags and metadata like you would need to be able to access in the VMS. Business processes may be integrated with access control systems. Applications such as uh, time attendance and visitor management systems could be interconnected. And then, of course, you need seamless communication between human resources systems and the access control system uh, as well. Otherwise, the company's assets and perhaps even the safety of its personnel are at risk when an employee is terminated. Let's take a look at the environment for access control. Um, the access control devices can help monitor activity flow around the build, uh, building. Um, in the interior of the building, access control is most common at entrances and exits. Scheduled access is common with main lobby doors unlocked during normal business hours. After hours access is available only with authorization under common access control configurations. Most of the time access control isn't required for hallways unless it's in a secure area. If you have high-priority targets that open to hallways, you may want to secure those uh, with access control locks. An example would be a network room that uh, has vulnerable equipment. Offices with high-priority targets uh, should be locked with uh, uh, access control as well. For example, the HR office or the accounting office may require authorization uh, due to storage of sensitive records. In the exterior of the area, um, there are some appropriate measures you can take. Around the perimeter, a fence is a form of access control. It directs traffic to entry gates, and locks can be placed at the gates uh, with uh, um, release mechanisms if you determine that's necessary. And a warehouse is not necessarily a um, uh, the parking lot, I guess, it would be another good area. You'll take a look at uh, security gates. Um, you can uh, place those uh, at access points to control your traffic coming in and out there. Um, the warehouse isn't necessarily an exterior area, but wide open spaces uh, uh, are kind of unique in an indoor environment. The warehouse houses are often locked as a, lock, a loss prevention measure. Now it's time for our first poll question, David. Okay, I'll launch that for us. The question is, what is the primary concern when regulating access control? And Okay, you should see the question there. Just select your, uh, from one of the choices, integrating many different building systems, carefully reading the specifications, live safety, knowing who has jurisdiction for code enforcement, and I don't know. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the primary concern when regulating access control? So we'll give you a few moments to uh, make your selections, and then we'll uh, show the results here.
and just a few more minutes for a few of you to make your selection. Okay, let's go ahead and show those uh, results. Okay, looks like 60% uh, have selected life safety and 40% integrating many different building systems. Right. So uh, the proper answer there is, of course, life safety. Most people guess that. That ch should be our, our driving factor. Um, all of these are important, you know, whether you're looking at uh, integrating different building systems or reading the specifications, um, knowing who has jurisdiction are all very important uh, things to keep in mind. But life safety is above all else. It's our primary directive. Um, let's take a look at some of the basic rules and standards that apply to access control. Um, while most physical security integration has to comply with building and fire codes, it doesn't uh, fall under the same scrutiny as access control. The difference is uh, passive security systems, such as cameras, don't have the same effect on people as an active security system like access control. Um, Access control will uh, actively lock doors, block access, and directly affects people moving in and around a facility. Uh, other systems, such as the CCTV camera systems, are past nature. They're just monitoring what's going on, but not necessarily impeding movement. And again, our primary directive here is life safety above all else. That's what we default to when we have no other code to, to fall back on. Design guidelines for constructing buildings are the building codes and fire codes adopted in the law. These codes dictate access control work and help a security integrator avoid issues when they're designing systems. There's a number of codes in use worldwide, but uh, most mu municipalities will rely on codes from the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. An important code reference is NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code and that's a widely used source. This code covers building construction, protection, and occupancy ratings covering issues of life safety. NFPA 72 is really a fire alarms code, but sometimes it cites access control due to integrations between door locks and life safety systems. Agencies will also refer to the International Building Code as well. The IBC is published by the International Code Council and many of the codes are designed to preserve public health and safety, providing safeguards from hazards associated with building design and construction. I've got a few links on the bottom of the page there that'll help you, that'll take you to the, uh, the NFPA uh, codes and standards, as well as the, the link for the International Building Code. And we'll include those in our follow-up communication with you as well. When in doubt about rules and regulations, and you will have doubts, uh, you may have to contact the AHJ, also known as the Authority Having Jurisdiction. Now, this isn't a particular agency, but rather an official designation. The term identifies organizations responsible for work compliance. Uh, here's a list of AHJs frequently found. The physical security integrators uh, would would need to uh, talk to prime authorities um, such as the fire marshal and the building inspector. The fire marshal works for the uh, office enforcing fire codes. His scope covers uh, field surveys and installation work, and he may even require his signature approval on project plans. The building inspector ensures that the work performed meets existing building codes for his jurisdiction. Um, in less common circumstances, the AHJ designation might go to the health department, engineers or architects, senior executives with the municipality, utility companies, or even insurance companies. These AHJs um, may not exercise any authority over video surveillance systems. Um, that's because video doesn't impact life safety for facilities. The AHJ will have much more interest in regulations concerning fire alarms and access control systems. In designing life, uh, or, or rather in designing safe access control, other sources uh, could apply as well. You might have to look for legacy codes in place uh, from the uh, 
uh, Building Officials Code Administrators International, also called BOCA. Um, the American with Disabilities Act, ADA, covers uh, accommodations for those who may have trouble accessing uh, public buildings due to design. Those access control systems are typically affected by design features such as doorknobs, turnstiles, accessible readers, door controls, uh, and alarms lacking audible or visual features. When you're reviewing a request for proposal that covers access control, you might see a specification for UL 294. Uh, the underwriter laboratories uh, provides a UL 294 certification that's stamped on security equipment. Uh, that mark will look like this. Uh, that's, the, that's the actual mark that you see there displayed. Um, that only applies to products such as intrusion detectors, burglar alarms, access control, safes, and vaults. Now, your access control system uh, has a harsh standard to live up to. Uh, the system is often considered a zero downtime system. Uh, the doors must always function. Controllers are often designed to work even when communication to the main panel or server is lost. The benefit here is a system that will continue operating without interruption even if the network goes down. The controller, uh, in some circumstances, actually holds on to some of the transactional data until connectivity can be restored to the server. The always on demands of access control system requires a high availability uh, computer hardware for the backbone of the system. Uh, that requirement describes a system that's designed to, to absolutely work. Availability is generally measured as a percentage of your uptime. Since uptimes vary from 99% to 99.999%, Availability is commonly expressed in uh, terms of nines. So uh, the average availability of, uh, of five nines, or 99.999%, represents the optimal performance for today's high availability equipment. Uh, for access control, the difference between four nines and five nines is, uh, is quite a lot. And for example, a system with only 99.99% of uptime could be down uh, for as much as one minute per week. Under those conditions, uh, a few outages during peak traffic periods could degrade the effectiveness of building security. In a 24-7 operation, the access control system plays many crucial roles in physical security. The alarm monitoring system is the visual window into the building's access control status. Security staff will depend on alarm monitoring for real-time notifications of all events that impact building security. An effective live video monitoring system uses uh, breakthrough alarms to push live video to monitoring stations as events occur. And those systems uh, always need to be online and guarantee a real-time response. Video verification provides the ability to compare live video of a person to an image stored in a computer database. Your uh, security staff confirms visual identification before granting access. Intrusion detection and fire alarms must operate without interruption as well. Alarm downtime is considered a security breach. Access to control equipment monitors and controls your door locks, motion detectors, request to exit control switches, um, glass break sensors, and other uh, equipment. These must be constantly and continually connected to the server. The effectiveness of an access control system is dependent on the uninterrupted ser uh, service of the central server computing system. Without a reliable backbone, a security could be compromised. Now let's take a look at our, our second poll question. Okay, I'll finish that for us. The question is, to which side of the door are fail-safe and fail-secure relevant? So for to which side of the door are fail-safe and fail-secure relevant, the choices would be the entry side of the door, excuse me, the exit side of the door, both sides of the door, neither side of the door, or I don't know. And we'll give you, again, just a few minutes here to... Uh, make your selection and uh, I'll share the results.
this is a, a great topic that's of utmost importance. We'll go into a lot of details here on fail safe and fail secure, uh, but locks come with these uh, specifications and, and access control equipment um, comes with this specification um, to help aid in the door operation in the event of an emergency. And the results are in with most selecting both sides of the door, 56%, a few with the exit side of the door, and um, a few at neither side of the door. Well, there's typically a lot of confusion here. Um, the, the correct answer in this circumstance is the exit side of the door. That's our correct answer. Let's take a look very closely at this. Um, few concepts carry greater significance than a fail-safe and fail-secure in terms of access control. This terminology uh, is specific to the door hardware operation. Fail-safe is when the electronic locking device is released or unlocked when power drops. Fail-secure is when the electronic locking device is secured or locked when power drops. This life safety function uh, will be cited in specifications or building codes. And it's important to determine whether or not the door hardware might harm people or aid in their safety in the event of an emergency. One way that people confuse these two is understanding which side of the door uh, they'll apply to. Fail safe and uh, fail secure terms reference entry control only. Manual egress for doors should be allowed at all times. AHJs uh, will reference NFPA 101 life safety code in this circumstance. It's important to understand in an emergency situation, nothing should prevent people from exiting the building. Electrified locks should be made to fail safe. If they can't be fail safe, then they can't be used. Um, most doors will default to fail safe. Uh, the design documents will tell you if uh, fail secure is required for specific doors. Now here's a few guidelines for fail secure to keep in mind. Fail safe uh, locks should be used on stairwell doors um, requiring re-entry. Any other doors which allow free access uh, upon uh, a fire alarm and power failure should be fail safe as well. Um, fail safe electric strikes uh, should not be used for a stairwell re-entry because fire doors require a fail secure electric strike for positive latching. Um, it's critical for fire doors to stay closed during a fire, so fail secure is used on these doors. These doors provide structural barriers to prevent a fire from spreading throughout a building. Uh, fire doors uh, do not uh, fire doors um, have a requirement uh, for fail secure uh, electric locks. Uh, I'm sorry, they do not have a requirement for fail secure electric locks, only for fail secure electric strikes. Well, we'll get to the difference uh, coming up. There may be con some confusion here due to code revisions and misunderstanding. So check with the approving bo body to verify their opinion on the, on the use here. Fail secure products are more common than fail safe due to security concerns. Fail secure products provide security when there is no power applied. Most electrified products, with the exception of electromagnetic locks, allow free egress at all times, regardless of whether they're fail safe or fail secure. Other hardware devices that are fail secure include electronic deadbolts, keypad locks, and electrified locks. However, the adoption of, and use of this hardware uh, may not comply with codes relating to emergency egress paths and are not commonly used in a fail secure configuration. Door types will affect how you approach your design for access control equipment. Each door may uh, present a different obstacle or design concern. You have to think of each door type independently and plan equipment mounting positions. Uh, door movement and traffic flow, uh, etc. For example, when you have a mounting position that has double doors with a mullion, a mullion mount card reader might be convenient and low profile. 
but you should consider the abuse and damage it might sustain due to the mounting position. When you're looking at doors that have a frame built around it, make sure you specify electronic strikes or readers uh, that are convenient for mounting. Appropriate mounting will leave enough room for devices and wiring to run inside the frame. A glass entryway door might be surrounded by glass and may impact access control features. You might also uh, find obstacles in running wire or mounting maglocks. You want to mount the card reader where it's convenient for people to access when moving through the doorway. An example might be avoiding positioning the card reader behind the door as it makes entry awkward once the card's been swiped. When you're working with glass doors, uh, mag locks are commonly used since a strike would be difficult to conceal. Choosing locks will depend on the door type. Access control hardware usually involves door hardware such as electric strikes or mag locks. You want to make sure you assess which type will be needed for specified uh, or specific doors. Rather, This is not a one-size-fits-all scenario. Choosing the right lock can be complex, uh, and I wouldn't recommend tackling that as, a, as an amateur. You want to do some research and, and understand what you're doing before you dive into it. A cylindrical lock uh, usually is used for interior or low security doors. This is due to a lower durability of the lock. A mortise lock is a very durable solution and the most secure. Uh, these will require a pocket door, a pocket cut in the door edge. Uh, they're more expensive and commonly used for interior light duty doors. A surface lock is a type of lock that, that requires minimal prep is commonly used with exit devices on egress doors and it mounts on the surface of the door. Deadbolt locks are, are seldom used alone and are never to be mounted on emergency egress doors. These are, are usually used to enhance security of existing locks. Dead latch locks uh, are a hybrid of a mortise lock and a deadbolt lock. Uh, most buildings keep these unlocked during occupied hours and then engage the lock when occupants are gone. Uh, they're ideal for glass doors. A mag lock is a special lock that mounts to the surface of the door frame and provides a strong magnetic bond holding the door secure. You'll want to make sure you're providing enough power for the lock to operate and you'll fuse the mag lock independently of the surveillance system. Mag locks are a good fit for high traffic exterior openings. The devices are strong and have a low operation cost. Um, they require minimal maintenance. Uh, the higher cost and less discreet mounting options limit these locks uh, for, for general uh, operation, general applications rather. By design, mag locks require electricity to operate, so when the power is removed, they fail safe by default. Mag locks typically fail safe. The drop in power is often a condition of the fire alarm system, so that if a fire pull is activated, the mag locks uh, all drop power at the same time. This can cause issues with the building security since exterior doors are unlocked and accessible. Supplying backup power to mag locks is very un uncommon and potentially illegal. You don't want to maintain power to a fail safe lock. Most locks, uh, mag locks, will be either 12 volts DC or 24 volts DC but other voltages and AC versions are available. Uh, power should be uh, supplied by an independent, individually fused power supply. The power supply uh, shouldn't be shared with any other security equipment. Since the mag lock draws power constantly uh, to hold the door in place, a power supply that's designed to handle the constant supply of current should be used. A mag lock has two prices, uh, two pieces that, that uh, make up the device. The armature is the flat section of steel that's fastened to the door, and the magnet is mounted to uh, in a fixed position to correspond with the armature. When the door is closed, the mag lock is engaged. A strong bond is achieved that keeps the door shut. Mag locks will have a bond rating indicating uh, the measurement of the pulling force required to match the magnetic bond of the lock. 
the lowest bond rating is 600 pounds, strongest bond rating is 2,700 pounds. Most exterior doors should be secured with a bond rated lock of at least 1,500 pounds. In most circumstances, uh, the door structure will fail in a brute force attack before the maglock fails. An important consideration uh, for maglocks is the orientation of the door. For an outswinging door, um, that's a simple installation. It's the default orientation for the maglock. This is because the door swings away from the magnet. In an in-swinging door, such as the example we see in the, the lower right picture, um, that situation, uh, your mag lock uh, or your door swinging would be blocked by the lock hung in a traditional manner. We overcome that by mounting the magnet up and mounted flush with the top of the frame and the armature is moved into position with a Z bracket. Double door mag locks may be installed on uh, dual leaf doors. Uh, the code typically requires that the adjacent doors release simultaneously. Electric door strikes are a door component that receives electrical impulses to engage or disengage the lock. The strike relies on uh, standard mechanical door locks for securing the door. The mechanical lock remains engaged and the strike activates to allow or deny entry through the door. Strikes are commonly configured for either fail safe or fail secure. The configuration of either function is typically a, a simple switch setting in the device. Strikes are often uh, the favored devices to provide fail secure functionality. Um, there are uh, two common types of strike. Uh, the mortise strike requires a cutout in the door frame, and the surface strike mounts on the inside surface of the door. Let's take a look at the mortise strike first. It's more common, and it requires a cutout in the frame. They're installed deep into the frame and require a precise cut and a clean fit. The mortise strike sits inside the door frame and is driven by a solenoid that changes the default polarity of the device. The keeper is the common component uh, of the strike that moves. When the door is locked, the keeper is rigid and prevents the door from opening. When the door is unlocked, the keeper swings out of the way of the latch and allows the door to open. Um, when you're using a strike, the door latch remains in the locked position and the strike controls whether or not the door can be pulled free or not. A surface strike is used when the companion locking hardware is mounted to the inside surface of the door. Uh, that could be an exit device or a surface deadbolt. The strikes are available in a variety of low voltage versions. AC electric strikes are the ones that make a buzzing noise when they're operating. DC models are quiet, uh, practically silent when you operate the, the uh, access control. Door strikes are less expensive uh, and use your existing hardware. They may have uh, uh, may also be more energy efficient than a maglock, as the strike only uses intermittent electric electricity impulses to operate. They don't require a constant current. Latch protectors are also helpful, especially where exterior strikes are used. An exterior strike may be vulnerable to tampering, and a latch protector uh, will help protect the strike from someone using a pry bar to gain access. Wireless locks do not require a cable run to the controller. They send a wireless radio transmission to the controller to communicate lock data. Uh, good wireless transmission is required, so you need to test connectivity when you're planning to use this type of a lock. A Wi-Fi lock is simil similar, however it connects to a computer network using a network Wi-Fi signal. A lot of people mix this up. Here's the simple difference. Wireless locks have a proprietary transmission, Wi-Fi locks require networking skill to implement. Wireless access locks are comprised of uh, two components, the door device and a receiver. The door device may be an integrated lock set incorporating all of the access devices into one piece of hardware. The card reader, pin pad, wireless transmitter, lever set, and lock are all built in. The benefits are obvious with this device. And you'll improve uh, aesthetics, eliminate cabling, and have a retrofit capability available. The 
cost per door is higher, and long-term maintenance will include uh, replacing batteries in the device. The wireless card reader interface converts wired signals from standard devices to a proprietary wireless signal. The device uh, will need power to the door to function. It makes sense at security gates uh, as power is available locally. Uh, conduit available uh, to hardwire the connection might not uh, be available and trenching is often cost prohibitive so a wireless signal uh, makes a lot of sense here. Proprietary wireless frequencies often transmit their data in 800 megahertz, 900 megahertz, or 2.4 gigahertz frequency ranges. These will come with a receiver and are intended to be a plug-and-play solution. The devices communicate in real-time, making uh, them useful for lockdown or real-time monitoring. Wi-Fi locks are a little bit different. They uh, use a standard 802.11 wireless Ethernet signal to transmit their data. They require some networking knowledge in order to sync with the access control system, and they'll also, uh, they also, uh, the power of consumption of these Wi-Fi devices might be limited in comparison with proprietary wireless devices. Your battery life will typically be affected because of the uh, Wi-Fi signal. Um, the Wi-Fi device may not transmit data in real time. It'll periodically send it minutes to the access control system in uh, intervals, and that could be intervals of 10 minutes to two hours. Consequently, alarms such as a forced door could be delayed, and instant lockdowns may not be able to be initiated remotely. When you're using either wireless technology, ideal operation uh, will require planning ahead. Wireless range uh, may vary from location to location. Test your connectivity. Uh, Testing it should be a standard operating uh, procedure when you're in the planning stage. Factors such as building construction, RF interference, and wireless frequency congestion may affect uh, device communication. As mentioned, uh, integrated lock sets uh, are a uh, hardware assembly containing all components uh, required to be fully functional. Uh, that could be self-contained. Uh, contained device for securing the door. Uh, it may include everything from a card reader to a power pack and may have some provision for wireless networking. These lock sets, though they're more expensive, are the best answer when quick integration is required. Uh, another lock type is an electronic bolt. It features a solenoid-driven hardened steel bolt. That's a very strong type of lock that could be placed in a high security area um, and you typically use that in the high security area uh, when a mag lock is impossible to mount. Exit devices like crash bars or PIR RTE sensors are required in the life safety code. The NFPA 101 section in this slide provides uh, the basic requirements for exit devices. Exit devices should be a part of your access control design plan. Generally speaking, exit devices are required in public buildings or buildings classified as commercial or industrial. Request to exit devices, or RTE, may be uh, manual or automatic. The PIR RTE is a passive infrared motion sensor that releases the door automatically as a person approach approaches. These motion sensors are mounted above the doors and detect people approaching the door's exit. When these are triggered, powers to the mag locks uh, is killed automatically. Any PIR may be used, but specialty P RTE PIRs are built with a limited detection range focused immediately in front of the door. These are considered to be the most uh, convenient due to uh, no human in intervention required uh, to operate the door. A push-button RTE requires to manually release the door by pressing a button. Uh, these are common and inexpensive to install. The buttons uh, mechanically interrupt power to the mag locks and other hardware. They're designed with a timer to cut power for approximately 30 seconds. Now, a crash bar is an exit device that's placed on a door. It releases the lock automatically when the crash bar is pushed. The most common exit device is a crash bar. Um, operation is simple, 
you push the bar, retract the latch, and the door swings open. Often these can be locked into an unsecure position as well. Let's look uh, quickly at credentials. Uh, they come in a few varieties, of course. Uh, there's badge cards, clamshells, key fobs, etc. But uh, for the access control integrator, the format class of the contactless proximity credential is uh, important information. Prox cards are still the king. They're low cost and more prevalent, and they have a decent level of security. I-class cards are billed as the next generation proximity card. They claim encrypted security and more capacity of user information. The biggest difference between the two credential types is frequency. The reader in use must match the frequency of the credential. The certain readers are designed to handle either frequency. Credentials are available by several companies, but the two that stand out are HID Global and NXP Semi Semiconductor. HID is the big boy uh, providing credentials for most of the security market. NXP offers credentials that are license-free and have adopted ISO standards. Authorization interface uh, comes in many different formats. Um, it's the gatekeeper, so to speak. The interface comes in, in several formats, such as the card reader is probably the most common. The gatekeeper here, authorization interface, allows people to pass or deny access. Um, you need to be aware of a few terms when considering uh, traffic passing the authorization point. Ingress is traffic that's flowing into the building. That's most commonplace uh, for authorization, building entrances. Egress is traffic that's flowing out of the building. Sometimes in higher security set settings, authorization is logged at the egress building as well. So you might have to badge in and badge out in those circumstances. Let's look at uh, some of the uh, other authorization interfaces. Uh, the card reader communicates with the controller before passing on info to the control server. The card reader's output must be compatible with the controller. And you need to take a look at the mounting surface for the card reader as, as well. Um, it can affect the type of card reader uh, that you'll use. If you wall mount a card reader, uh, or if a wall mount card reader uh, is used, it may not work on a door mullion or a security gate bollard. You might have to have a specialty card reader for that. Card readers communicate their information using a protocol uh, the controller can understand. The typical reader protocols are Wigand and OSDP. Wigand has been the standard communication protocol between readers and controllers. Adoption for the, the Wigand protocol is widely used. OSDP offers the better device manageability, status monitoring, and data handling, but it's a newer type of protocol. Credentials uh, are the component carried by the user. There's a few different kinds here. The standard proximity credential requires a holder to get the card within close proximity. Smart cards are the newer type of credential. They include an onboard circuit chip, offers higher encryption, data storage, and rewriting capabilities. A contact card requires insertion into a card reader, like a bank card or a hotel, hotel door card. And a contactless uh, credential requires only close proximity to a reader. It transmits its data via an RFID antenna communicating info to the reader. Barcode and magstripe credentials are becoming uh, uh, obsolete due to fit standards. But these are susceptible to uh, degaussing or scratches that impact their reliability. And then uh, finally, a newer type of credential is gesture sensitive. These are prox proximity style credentials. They're more secure and don't activate the prox credential signal until they're moved in a specific pattern. Uh, this type of, uh, of gesture sen sensitive credential is being incorporated into cell phones uh, that could be used as credentials. In some cases, you may use a keypad instead of a card reader. Um, these are common, uh, these are the most common type of access device, and they've been around the longest. They appear to be more secure, but that's not necessarily true. Um, once a PIN number is shared, uh, security is diminished. 
Keeping your PIN number secure means encouraging password protection. That means avoid sharing your PINs with anyone. Also, you have to prevent shoulder surfing, keeping somebody from uh, uh, capturing your PIN by watching it and recording it. Another reason security is diminished uh, is where your reporting will be skewed. If you have multiple people sharing the same PIN number, then reports are not accurate in terms of verifying who accessed the keypad at any given point in time. Let's take a look at uh, biometrics. Uh, it's been breaking ground with new technology for several years. Unlike keys, cards, or number sequences, biometric security readers provide access control that can't be transferred. Using security devices uh, like fingerprint readers, iris scans, palm print readers, and more um, is, uh, is, are your common types of uh, device. These are considered characteristic-based systems. The physical characteristic is unique to each individual, and the identifying characteristic must be captured and stored in a da database in advance. When access is attempted, the characteristic is compared with the existing database in milliseconds to determine if access will be granted. Uh, these systems include hardware and software that must be compatible with the rest of the access control system. Uh, and they make it nearly impossible to falsify biometric information. Fingerprints, they're unique to every person. A fingerprint scanner is the most affordable and convenient method of verifying a person's identity. The user places a thumb or points or finger on the scanner while the scan reads the print. It's then compared with the database to validate the user. Hand geometry readers, they measure the phys physical characteristics of a person's hand. It looks at length of fingers, width, and depths of hand contours, and it can take around 100 measurements of the hand's geometry. Uh, there's a few types of eye scanner on the market. A retinal scanner maps the capillary pattern of the retina, uh, which is a thin nerve on the back of the eye. The technology is very accurate, though some people are hesitant to use it because it requires close proximity or contact with the scanner. An iris scanner uh, focuses on the colored portion of the eye. It also offers high accuracy. Identification only takes a few seconds and doesn't require physical contact with the sensor. Facial recognition uh, can be used in access control as well. A camera will capture the image of the human face and the image will be compared with stored images in the database. Features related to the geometry of the face are compared, such as size, position of eyes, nose, and mouth. And the computer program will quickly make the comparisons and verify access. Let's talk about uh, authorization factors. Um, we refer to them uh, as the form factor the credential takes, uh, such as the PIN card, or the key code, personal characteristic, et cetera. Um, we'll keep in mind here that several factors can be used in combination and it helps to increase security. A simple example of that is visual verification. When someone comes to a locked door, rings a bell, a gatekeeper can check the camera or the peephole to see who is there before they open the door. Um, multiple uh, multi-factor credentials uh, can be employed in an access control system. These are credentials that are designed to be combined. They build on top of one another for added layers of security. Uh, here are the factor groups. Something you have, a credential or permission given to the user to keep with them for access, such as a badge, token, or fob. Something you know is typically a code or a password kept private by the user, such as a PIN number. Something you are adds a biometric feature or physical characteristic that's unique to the user, such as a fingerprint or palm print. And then someone you trusted verifies you, employs a human to positively, positively identify or vouch for the user, uh, such as a security guard that grants access based on uh, uh, identification. Again, uh, more than one credential can be used uh, in order to gain authorization. Uh, two factors, uh, in our example here, we would use a key fob um, and something the user knows, such as a PIN number, falls into that category. Three factors takes a two-factor authorization and adds a biometrics authorization, such as a fingerprint scanner, for a total of three pieces required for authorization. Four factors is very secure. It requires an appropriate uh, um, 
high security, such as what would be used at a military base. It takes three-factor authorization and adds a man checkpoint, for example. Door controllers are a crucial component here uh, for the access control system. The hardware is often hidden away in a junction box inside the drop ceiling. Uh, even though they're not visible, it's a central uh, component that unites the system. Access control systems require, uh, will likely require proprietary door uh, controllers at the door that function with the head end uh, panel or server. Every reader, sensor, and lock are tied into the access control system at the controller. Um, in the enterprise level system, door controllers are designed to operate independently even when network communications are down. They can store thousands of records should the communication with the server be interrupted. When the connection resumes, the data stored is sent to the server. Uh, the door controller has one function, to bridge the gap between the door hardware and the access control software. Here's a few types. CAN enclosures are the legacy uh, style enclosure. They have a printed circuit board that's housed inside the box, and they usually connect to a server via a proprietary cabling system. Newer controllers are a standalone device that's similar to an appliance. That door hardware uh, connects to the self-contained device, and it communicates directly to the server via a network connection. Integrated door controllers are built into a combination device like a lock set that uh, contains all of the door hardware. Uh, those can have advantages and disadvantages. While the installation may be easier, it could be less secure. Uh, the controller stores crucial information that should remain secure. A vulnerable controller mounted uh, along, along with the reader on the unsecure side of the door could easily be breached. Moving on into uh, transmission and networks, um, many are using IP-based systems. Uh, this operates on a, a computer network transmitting data over Ethernet cables or Wi-Fi. You'll need some skill in networking in order to configure an IP-based system. One advantage of the IP-based access control system is power over Ethernet. The uh, power over Ethernet um, is a key factor in using, uh, uh, managing your power. So uh, there's two types of POE available. 802.3 AF supports 15.4 watts of power and is used by almost all POE-enabled controllers today. 802.3 AT supports POE plus up to 25.5 watts of power. There's only a small uh, percentage of, of access control equipment using this type of POE. So the bottom line is here is how much are you going to uh, to power on your uh, use, uh, using PoE from a switch? Most controllers providing PoE only provide enough power to controllers uh, and devices uh, at one or two doors. It's going to be unlikely for you to find controllers that are designed for four doors or more. In our scenario here, uh, the devices drawing the most power constantly should be powered separately. separately. Uh, my recommendation would be not to rely on the PoE power for the maglock. The maglocks might have a harder time operating off of PoE since they draw significant and continuous current. Uh, the B PoE controller manages the power for connected devices. Readers are the most common device receiving power from the controller. Your locks uh, may use uh, pass-through power. Strikes uh, may be able to operate off of PoE since they only need a short impulse. Uh, you have to budget your power at each door uh, or provide power locally to these door devices. And you need to know what the power draw of the equipment is that you're planning. Um, and you want to know how much pass-through power your controller is capable of outputting uh, to attached devices. And that'll help you plan your design appropriately. And then finally, let's take a look at cables. Um, there's many access control systems still using hardwire or serial connected cable systems. And these are proprietary uh, type of cables uh, that create its own uh, communication path. You have uh, six conductor cables, which uh, are used typically to connect to readers and controllers. Um, four conductor, eight conductor cables are commonly used for the main control panel, uh, between the main control panel and the door controller. And then your 
door devices uh, such as the PIR RTE are wired using uh, that type of cable. And then your two conductor cable is used to deliver power to devices such as mag locks, strikes, and accessory devices. You want to make sure you take a look at the drain wire that uh, helps to, it's basically an unjacketed copper tin conductor that's bundled in the jacketed cabling and that wire provides a ground cable shielding helping to reduce interference and improve data transmission. We did it. We got all the way through. And next month we're going to take a look at um, uh, software management and physical security, uh, unifying your, your physical security platform. Um, just didn't have time to get it all in today, David. Good job, Keith. Good job. Um, a few questions did come in. I think if you want to try to squeeze one or two in, um, we've got a few yeah. minutes to do so, and then I can wrap it up for us. Sure. Uh, let's see here. Um, which version of the building and fire codes uh, should I follow? That seems like a trick question. Um, you'd think it would be easy, but it, it's not. Um, not always an easy answer. The right thing to do is to follow the version of the code that the AHJ follows. Um, that could vary among your entities. Um, the most recent version of the NFPA 101 Life Safety Code is 2015, though there's many jurisdictions out there that are still working off of uh, 2012 rules or earlier, or maybe a different uh, uh, rule altogether. The AHJ has the authority to adopt the code, so check with them for clarification on which code they follow. Okay, let's, let's uh, fit in one more and then I'll wrap up here. Uh, how does access control work with building systems like the fire alarm? Uh, well, a fire alarm pole is not an exit device, but it kind of works like one, um, sort of. The fire alarm is configured to drop your lock power when the fire pole is activated. Mag locks and access control systems have contacts to tie into the, uh, the fire alarm. The AHJs may require proof of a successful access um, control. They'll, they'll run you through a test and uh, see if you can override the system by using the fire pole. Okay, thank you, Keith. I'll uh, go ahead and wrap up the uh, webinar here. Um, you will see our contact information posted there. Uh, again, my name is David Martin, and uh, Keith Harris was our presenter. You can reach out to either one of us via phone or email, and we'd be glad to help. Don't forget, we'd like uh, for attendees to complete a quick survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, on the survey, again, you can request a completion certificate, and we'll email out uh, the items promised in today's webinar. We'll also send answers to the questions um, that we weren't able to get to. Um, the webinar recording will be posted to our video archive on the LENSEC website in a few days, uh, which you'll find at www.lensec.com. Also, along with previous recorded webinars covering a variety of topics related to physical security. Again, thank you, Keith. Uh, great job for taking the, the time to be with us today. Uh, my name is David Martin. Uh, again, if either of us can help you, please let us know. Um, that wraps up our webinar. Thank you for attending. Uh, we will uh, hope to see you again next month uh, with another installment of our Step and Security webinar series. In June, we'll be completing the part two series on access control, uh, which will be covering software management and uh, unifying your physical security platforms. So again, thank you for attending. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you.